In this PowerPoint, we're going to take at the different types of insomnia, how it's diagnosed, and some of the complications in treating insomnia. Let's go on to our next slide. When people think of insomnia, they think of not sleeping, and they immediately go to total lack of sleep, and actually that's very rare. There is one condition where a person does not sleep at all, not a second, and that is called fatal familial insomnia, and this results in death because people cannot live without sleeping, so their lifespan is very, very short because they do not sleep at all. However, insomnia actually refers to a person experiencing reduced sleep duration, fragmented sleep, and poor quality of sleep. There are three t subtypes of insomnia, or insomnia can be broken down into three different categories. There's difficulty initiating sleep, which we call sleep onset insomnia. There's awakening frequently from sleep, and we call this sleep maintenance insomnia. And then there's awakening long before the desired time to get up, and we call this early morning awakening or terminal insomnia. Let's go on to our next slide. Hyposomnia. This is when a person experiences insomnia, but they do sleep for at least a few hours a day, but they are completely unaware that they do so. So they are convinced that they do not sleep, and if it, when they're really tested, they do sleep just a little bit during the day. This is actually fairly common, and we often see it in teenagers. Let's go on to our next slide. Of persons surveyed and complaining of sleep disturbances, 10% to 30% of them complained of severe or constant sleep problems. The number one complaint was sleep maintenance insomnia. So that's where they frequently awake after um, they've gone to sleep. Other problems that these patients complain of include memory problems, attention and concentration problems, decrease in mood and lessen quality of life, and problems with relationships. So if you think about it, sleep maintenance problem or insomnia, they're going to have fragmented sleep. They wake up in the middle of the night, they struggle to get back to sleep, eventually they do and it happens all over again. So sleep fragmentation, the symptoms of someone with sleep maintenance insomnia, is very similar to someone who's experiencing sleep fragmentation because the same things are happening. Insomnia is more common in shift workers, women, older persons, those with medical or psychiatric conditions. Um, it is a risk factor for depression and reduced quality of life. And it is common occurrence with daytime consequences, meaning they do suffer daytime symptoms, like problems with memory and attention and concentration. Let's go on to our next slide. Transient insomnia is a sleep problem lasting less than one month during periods of stress or change where an individual may exhibit time-limited difficulties with sleep. Although this is a time-limited problem, meaning it eventually goes away, it can become persistent insomnia based off a person's genetic makeup, personality, etc. There are external causes and internal causes. Some of the external causes include light, noise, stress, problems in their relationships, and changing sleep habits or patterns, and change in medication use. Some of the internal factors include pain, or other medical conditions such as asthma or COPD. Let's go on to our next slide. Chronic insomnia is a sleep problem lasting longer than one month with some degree of daytime impairment or distress. Hyperarousal is significant among a portion of insomnia patients, meaning they're just super aroused and they cannot um, get relaxed enough to go to sleep. HPA overactivation occurs in a portion of insomnia patients. Polysomnographic testing is not a diagnostic tool for insomnia. Um, if you had a person come into a sleep lab, hook them up for your sleep study, you're going to watch them sit awake in bed all night. Insurance is not going to reimburse because insurance does have minimum sleep um, qualifications in order for them to reimburse for testing. So, Sleep history, sleep diary, sleep questionnaire, all of these are necessary for diagnosis though. Let's go on to our next slide. When we talk about insomnia, we have primary insomnias, where insomnia is the, the key issue, and then there's secondary insomnias, where there's a, some other medical condition is the key problem, and insomnia is a side effect. So with um, our primary, primary sleep disorders, 
uh, one of our first types is psychophysiological insomnia. And this is where a person becomes so anxious and frustrated with their inability to sleep that it arouses them more and exacerbates the situation. I'm guessing probably all of us have experienced this at some time in our life. Maybe we had a test the next day or we had to get up early for a big day at work and we try to go to sleep and we keep watching that clock and as the more we watch it we know we have less and less sleep left and you end up getting yourself worked up and then can't go back to sleep or can't achieve sleep. Then there's sleep state misperception. This is also called pseudo insomnia and this is where a person believes they're not sleeping at all or they're sleeping very little but when they're tested by polysomnogram they find that they sleep a normal amount of time. You will find in the morning when you talk to your patients, each um, sleep disorder center typically has a questionnaire where you ask the patient a few questions. And there's usually one question about this that asks um, how long they think they slept. And this is what the doctor's trying to identify is if there's a little sleep state misperception going on. There's hypnotic dependent sleep disorders. And this is, um, occurs following abrupt cessation of sedatives or hypnotics. A person experiences severe insomnia, nervousness, intense dreams or nightmares, or other physiological symptoms. Fatal familial insomnia, we already talked about this. It's very rare. It is a neurological disorder with family history of, of um, the condition. And these people do experience total or near total absence of sleep, which eventually results in death. And then there's inadequate sleep hygiene. This isn't really a type of insomnia, but when people have inadequate sleep hygiene, that means they're not doing things that are going to promote a good night's sleep, and they result in the complaint of trouble sleeping or insomnia. Um, sometimes we can improve a person's sleep hygiene, and their sleep does improve. However, someone with um, true insomnia, inadequate or improving their sleep hygiene is not going to have that much of an effect. It's not a cure-all by any means, but they're good habits everybody should take in order to get the best night's sleep possible. Let's go on to our next slide. Some of the secondary um, sleep disorders include psychiatric disorders. Um, insomnia is commonly associated with different psychiatric disorders, including anxiety, acute stress, post-traumatic stress, major depression, bipolar, and schizoaffective disorder. Many medical conditions may cause secondary insomnia. Some of these include pain syndromes, asthma, COPD, fibromyalgia, migraine and cluster headaches, GERD, peptic ulcers, and there are many, many more. Let's go on to our next slide. How do they evaluate insomnia, or what do they do about it when someone has that complaint? Well, there's no current standard for data collection in assessing insomnia. They don't have a way where they evaluate it and give it a grade like they do sleep apnea or excessive daytime sleepiness. However, when someone does have a complaint in ins of insomnia, one of the first things they um, will do is have them consult with a sleep specialist. Um, this is important because they're the expert in the field and they um, are able to open the patient's eyes and the primary doctor's eyes to things that they may have otherwise ignored. Um, this also offers security to the patient that their complaint is being heard and addressed. Let's go on to our next slide. Um, when a sleep specialist does see a patient for insomnia, he's going to do a physical exam, a sleep history, objective assessment and self-monitoring, and a psychological assessment. Let's take a look at each of these at our next slide. With our physical exam, this allows a physician to identify physical abnormalities that may suggest OSA or other sleep disorder that would need to be ruled out. With the sleep history, this identifies the patient's sleep troubles, their perception of their sleep troubles, their sleep-wake rhythms, their circadian function. This assesses their daytime sleepiness. It identifies how sleep troubles are affecting their quality of life, identifies medical history, which may or may not play a role in the sleep issues. This allows for evaluation of parasomnias, and it identifies if there's a family history of medical or other sleep problems that would be um, contributing to the situation. Let's go on to our next slide. Objective assessments and self-monitoring. There is a Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, and this is a self-report inventory. It evaluates subjective sleep quality and disturbance over the previous month. The Epworth Sleepiness Scale, this is a subjective assessment of daytime sleepiness. 
the owl lark questionnaire this doesn't help diagnose anything but it does identify a preference person's preference for mornings or evenings which gives us an idea of their circadian function sleep diaries is helpful in identifying circadian rhythm disorders and insomnia psychological assessment this evaluates a person's cognitive emotional interpersonal and behavioral functioning it measures severity of depression anxiety anger irritability and other moods or traits many measurement tools can be used to do this um, and then lastly, we have polysomnography and actigraphy. Um, typically with insomnia, we won't do a polysomnogram, as I mentioned before, but they may do some actigraphy. And, and with actigraphy, a person wears something that looks like a watch for a few days and it can track their activity. Um, it may be valuable to other po populations where diagnosis is complicated. Um, by other conditions, um, but it is of only limited use because it is only looking at their activity and not truly identifying when they're asleep or when they're awake. Let's go on to our next slide. Treatment. At this point, we're not really concerned with identifying how to treat insomnia. As I mentioned, very few come to the sleep lab, but we do want to be able to identify the complications in treating patients. Um, and most of the complications include these patients typically have complicated medical histories or complicated psychological illnesses. Oftentimes there's incompatibility between medications to help treat insomnia and medications used to treat other medical or psychological illnesses. And there are many other pr complications that come into play, but these are the big ones. This concludes the PowerPoint.